If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. We'll actually start in the last verse of chapter 1, but we'll spend most of our time in chapter 2 this morning. When I first became a youth minister, the youth minister who preceded me, uh, Tim, was the king of the acronym. Uh, and so everything the youth group did down to the name of the youth group uh, was a series of words that if you put them together, you got the first letter of every word and it made a word. So the youth group I came into was hyper, which did not excite me a lot. Uh, but uh, it was uh, helping your people establish relationships was what it stood for. Uh, and I thought, okay, we'll run with that for a little bit. Uh, they had an event called Loft where they all got together to sing and it was Living Our Father's Triumph. Uh, they had a big uh, leadership event every year that was TLC, the Teen Leadership Conference. At one point they were FBI, Faith Built Involvement. Everything had an acronym. And I thought to myself, if this is youth ministry, I'm in serious trouble because I'm not creative enough for this. I can't come up with all of these. And uh, sure enough, after Tim had been gone for about a year, the acronyms gradually faded away until there was maybe one left and we just did other things with other words. Uh, and so you probably have noticed when I do sermons, there's usually not a lot of alliteration within the points that we do. Uh, but I was mentioning to Jet after class this morning, preparing for the sermon, uh, I noticed out of the first four points that I had, three of them began with a P. And I thought, oh, it's time to get the thesaurus out today. Uh, and so all of our points, and there's a bunch of them, by the way, uh, and I only had to go with a thesaurus for three or four, uh, all have a P uh, involved. So if that helps you remember, great. Uh, if that freaks you out on the microphone, because there'll be a lot of popping uh, today, we'll just see what happens. But uh, all of our points will begin with a P today, uh, and we'll, we'll try to remember those as we go. So to remind us where we ended last time with Nehemiah, uh, at the end of chapter one, uh, we are going to see what it is to make the most of opportunities in life. And I don't know about you, but I have had a lot of times in life that I have thought to myself after something came up, you know, I really should have said this. Or maybe I really shouldn't have said this, or I should have done this or not done this. Uh, I mentioned the school supply drive yesterday, uh, and some of you who are working there were probably thinking, how did he know that they were thankful? He wasn't here for most of it. Uh, I had a, a get-together with a bunch of friends from college that was planned back in the spring. Uh, and so as soon as it ended, I came up here just in time to see Juanita walking out with stuff saying, you're too late. Uh, but there were still two people getting school supplies, Juanita, so I was here. Um, <clears throat> but I got the stories of everybody saying they were thankful and all of that. But as I got there, people who were part of the drive, people who were working, were already saying, next year... This is what we need to do differently. And everybody had ideas of what would be better, what would be different. And as we look at the opportunities that come our way in life, it's so easy for us to let things pass by for any number of reasons. Maybe we're timid uh, and we think, well, somebody else will handle this. Maybe we're, we're frightened of what will happen. I think I've mentioned to you before, I had a friend in college that was really interested in a girl, but terrified by the idea of asking her out. Uh, it was not me. It really was a friend. Uh, and he was terrified of it. And he would always say, I will ask her out the next time I see her. And then he would make it his mission to avoid her at all costs for the next week because he didn't really want to take that step of asking this girl out. I think sometimes with opportunity, we do that. We just think, you know, I, I just, I'm afraid of what could happen. And I was like this, by the way, I'll admit to you, with the school supply drive coming up yesterday, uh, as I was putting the Facebook ad out there, I thought to myself, I don't know how hard to push the ad. Because on the one hand, I want enough people to be here that the supplies go. On the other hand, I don't want an angry mob. Uh, because I know we have a, a number of supplies. We had a ton of stuff over there, by the way. But at the same time, I don't want 400 people to show up, and then suddenly we don't have enough stuff for 400 people, and what do we do? And I kind of talk myself into, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm kind of scared of this. What, what if it's bad? What? And it was great. And the people who came appreciated it, and the people who worked, worked hard. And that's usually how opportunity goes when it's something that God has brought our way. So as we think of making the most of opportunities, we'll remind ourselves of where Nehemiah ended uh, in verse uh, 11 of chapter 1, where he's praying to God and he says this, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. And what we will see in Nehemiah's making the best of his opportunity, and something I think we can learn a lot from making the best of opportunities as well, is that these things for us need to be 
personal. They don't need to be, somebody else should really do this. They don't need to be, this is a great idea, and now somebody just needs to take it and run with it. We need to recognize that these are things that God has brought before us for us to do. Nehemiah, cupbearer to the king, not wall builder, not architect, not engineer, not mason work guy. He is cupbearer to the king, sees this as a personal thing, something he needs to be involved in. I was reminded just this past week of, uh, we do the Wednesday night for the master thing here, uh, which started as kind of this thing where there are a lot of service things. Uh, gradually, the service things have kind of tapered off, and I think we'd love to see those be revived again. We had a similar thing in Searcy. It was Monday night for the master there. Uh, and I remember Phil, this guy who was a deacon there in Searcy, came into an elders meeting one night. He had visited a church in Texas who did this thing called Monday for the Master. And he explained to us what it was, and he was all excited about it, and he thought, this is something our church really needs to do. And the elder said to him, okay, Phil, when do you start? And Phil, for just a moment, thought, this is not what I had in mind. This is a great idea. This is not my thing. Phil was a deacon over something else. He just saw something he thought was good, something the church should do. And sure enough, Phil was tasked with that thing, that thing, and Phil went out and he got volunteers and he made a plan, uh, and I would imagine Phil's wife helped him out a lot with all of these things too, and then the next thing you know, they have this thing, uh, and the, the reason it came to mind, he actually made a post about it on Facebook last week because they've been doing it for over 10 years now, this thing where they get together on Monday night, they have a meal, and they serve, and he never knew going into the meeting that night, this is something that will become personal for him. Now, it has since gone on from Phil to another person in charge of it, but he still looks back at that as, here's a thing that I was a part of the beginnings of. And how exciting is that? For Nehemiah, it's not someone else should take care of this wall. He feels a personal responsibility for that. And I think God puts that on us as well. So then he begins chapter two this way. It says, in the month of Nisan, which is around uh, March, April, kind of in that time of the year, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So Nehemiah is regularly there before the king, but as the guy who's the cupbearer to the king, you're not supposed to bring the room down. And so when he's there before the king, he at the very least is not sad. I would imagine he probably tries to stay positive and happy as best as he can. And what we see with Nehemiah, this is the first time I had to use the thesaurus, by the way. What we see with Nehemiah is he has proximity to the situation. And for a lot of us, we kind of have that same thing, don't we? Uh, for us, as we're putting together the school supply thing yesterday, we have teachers here who understand what the needs are at school and what the needs are not at school. And so we're able to talk to them and figure out what, what is it we need to do here. Nehemiah realizes, even though I'm not an architect or an engineer or a stonemason or all of those things, I do have access. And the king is here, and I can do something with that. I feel like within our church, God has placed each of us in the place that we are in for a purpose. And do we make use of that for his kingdom as much as we should, or do we just assume these things are separate somehow? And there is our work world and our personal world and our church world, and the two don't intertwine all that much, but sometimes there's opportunity there where they do, and we can do something as a result of that. In verse 2, it says, The king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are sick? Uh, seeing you are not sick, that is nothing but sadness of the heart. This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. And so he's kind of concerned, but at the same time, what we see with Nehemiah is he has a personal relationship with the king. Now, clearly there is a differential of power here in this relationship, but there is enough of a relationship that the king recognizes in Nehemiah, there's something wrong here. I think God wants that of us today too, for us to have the kind of relationships with our friends, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, when something is off, that someone around us will be able to see that and ask about that. Or when something is good, as Jet talked about in class this morning, when there is that hope that we are living with, when we have a hope of heaven within us, that people around us will see and want to ask so that we have a reason to have, uh, so that we understand there's a reason for us to know the hope that we have and to be able to explain that to somebody else, as Peter writes about in his letter. We are people who live in such a way that with our relationships, we make connections. And one of the, way people, the ways people came yesterday was friends from here told them, our church is giving away school supplies. Maybe we can help you with that. Uh, one of the ways that people come into contact with the church and a lot of the new members we've had in recent times is because it's the relationships. 
There was a time within the way we did church things, a lot of that happened through a gospel meeting or something like that. And they're fine. I'm not against them or anything like that. But most of that happens nowadays because of how our culture works through relationship. So are we making the most of the opportunities we have in our relationships? So he said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So Nehemiah has a provocation for action. He sees what has happened to his homeland, and even though he is in a place that although he is a servant, he's got a pretty comfortable spot, doesn't he? I mean, if you're in exile, there could be worse places to be than in the presence of the king frequently being the guy who brings him his cup. There are a lot worse jobs you could have. But he doesn't think about how good he has it. He thinks about where I come from, my heritage, it's a mess. And I need to do something about that. So what's our provocation? What's the thing that pushes us to do something? And if nothing else for us as Christians, should it not be that we have that hope and we live in a world that is very hopeless right now? The world in which we feel like we're in exile sometimes does not have the hope in Christ that we have because they don't know about it. The world around us, if we're concerned about heaven and hell and who's going where, and the fact that we know the gospel and have been called to share it with others, should that be enough to provoke us to do something about that? Not to assume somebody should tell them this story. Somebody should tell them these things, but instead to realize I should be the one to take this message to the people around me who I care about. So then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And we probably could have added another obvious one in here, prayer, which I didn't, but you'll notice Nehemiah prefaces all this with prayer, and then it's still going on throughout the process. He prayed to the king of heaven, and then I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you may send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may re rebuild it. So Nehemiah asks for permission. And I would say for us, it's good to ask for permission when that is a thing that is possible when it comes to the things we need to do for God. And what I mean by that is this. There are in different nations around the world today, this morning, and it's probably not morning where they are. I don't know if they're behind or ahead. But when it comes to the time for Sunday morning for them, they will get together in a smaller format, maybe in somebody's house or apartment, and do what we're doing this morning. And if the government knew about it, they would be in trouble because they've lived in a place where that's not free. And so for them, maybe to ask governmental permi permission is probably not the best bet. So there are times where maybe that's not the route to go, but most of the time, if we can do what we need to do for Christ and do that within the system that is here, we will find a lot more success that comes of that. So if we're not always constantly fighting against, and I hope you've noticed that theme throughout the book or throughout the, the time of exile that we've looked at, is yes, there are times where there is an edict com that comes down and they just cannot follow that. But so many times what they do is built around respect for the system that is there. And so even though they serve a very worldly king or under his rule, they still try to work through that system to get the thing of God done in that process. And so for Nehemiah, rather than running away, Nehemiah goes to the king and says, here's what I need. This is what I would like to do. And he asks for permission. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me, uh, given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. A letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beans for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. So he has a plan. He doesn't just jump out without thinking it through. He doesn't, he has a plan. Okay, king, here's the timing of it. Here's what I'm going to need. Here's the permissions of different people. Here are the materials. And so he sets forth to how am I going to do this thing? And for the planners among us, you love this. If you're a list maker and you like to check things off the to-do list, I actually read in a, in a book a couple weeks ago uh, that sometimes if your to-do list is not going well, go ahead and put a few things on there you just finished yesterday so you can feel better about it. Check them off and then go with the things that are coming next. We plan. And so we plan for what is it we're going to do. And there are so many things in life that we realize to have success in these things, you're going to need a plan. 
I ran into Bart in the back. Uh, We were talking hot dogs since that was the meal yesterday. Uh, And I noticed Bart had the little thing in his hand where he was checking off the people who were here to do things. That list of people was not just written down by Bart this morning before he got here. It was planned. That list of people has been in process for quite a while now. And now he's checking off those people. For us, as we're doing these things of God, are we planning to do the things of God? And if we realize God has a world that needs to be reached, are we planning for, well, how are we going to go about doing that? Or even more so, not to say we too much, how are you going to go about doing that? How am I going to go about doing that? Because for Nehemiah, again, this is a personal plan that he's making. And you'll notice at the end of verse 8, and the king granted me what I was asked, not because of the king's power, not because of what the king could do, for the good hand of my God was upon me. And we see in the midst of these things that we were doing that God's providence is here. God has planned for all of this long before it began to happen. God planned for them to be in exile where they were long before any of this happened. And for Nehemiah to be the guy long before Nehemiah was even born. And so for us, all of these things that we look at and we think it's too big, it's too hard, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do the right thing? How am I going to be in the right place? This is something someone else should do. God has mapped this out, planned this out long before we've even started. And then as we honor that plan, God is going to work within it. So he will take a worldly king like Artaxerxes and he will bless Nehemiah through what Artaxerxes is doing. And although Artaxerxes might think this is all me and what I'm doing, God knows better, and so does Nehemiah, and so do we. So whether it is a worldly king we have or a godly king that we have, God's plan can work because of his providence. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly. We'll come back to them in a minute, by the way that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. And then I arose in the night and I had a few men with me and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night to the valley of the gate, uh, uh, to the valley gate of the dragon spring, to the dragon spring, sorry, and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went up in, in the night by the valley and inspected the wall and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And so you will see here that Nehemiah is given perspective in what he looks at. He had heard what it was going to be like, but then he wanted to go out and see what it's going to be like. And too often for us, I think we try so hard to remove ourselves from the world that we forget what our world is like. There is a value in actually being in the midst seeing what people are struggling with, seeing what is going on. And Nehemiah goes out and he tours all of that. And he sees, okay, exactly what is this job that is going to be done? And so what does that look like for us? Are we assuming what the world around us needs? Or are we asking the people what they need? What I loved about when Thorin brought this idea up about the school supply thing last month was that he mentioned you know, a lot of people will call the church and ask if we do anything with school supplies. It was not our idea. You know, we didn't think, you know, I'll bet our people need school supplies around here. It was, they were calling and we listened to, here's a need, and can we do something about this? So when we consider the needs that are here, are we doing what we assume is the thing, or are we doing what we know is the thing because we've seen it? And Nehemiah goes out and he had heard about the wall, but now he has seen it and seen what a a mess it is. And the officials in verse 16 did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, and the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them by the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also the words that the king had spoken to me and they said, let us rise up and build so they strengthened their hands for the good work. Notice all the us, we, they, there going on here in these verses. Nehemiah had people. If churches around the world could ever make use of all of the people, I cannot even begin to comprehend what would be done. 
There is this thing within church life that is called the 80-20 rule. I've heard about it since before I was even in ministry, which is basically this. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. And I have found that to hold basically true everywhere. There are just a lot of folks that don't do as many things and that 20% that seems to do everything. And Nehemiah realizes, I can't build this wall by myself. You ever had that moment when you're trying to do something, where you're trying to do it? You know, you, you when you were two years old, decide you want to do everything by yourself, and then that never wore off? You ever run into something and you think to yourself, why am I doing this by myself? Uh, I was, the thing I did do because I felt guilty because I wouldn't be here for a good chunk of the thing yesterday, uh, I went and bought a lot of the stuff at Staples and at Walmart and at Sam's uh, that the money was donated for and unloaded it. And I was so excited that the unloading days were all like 103 degrees here in Oklahoma. And, you know, by the second load, I'm just drenched Bring this in. The day I went to buy cases of paper, I found Nathan, my son, and I said, you have a job today. You're the paper man. And he unloaded the paper, uh, paper cases and for some reason was not drenched like I was. I don't know what that was about. And I thought, you know, I should have been doing this with help all along. There would be somebody who would love to come up here and uh, maybe not love, maybe that's the wrong word, but they would be willing to come up here uh, and lug all this stuff in and put it out and all of that stuff. How often do we think, I'll just do this on my own. I will get this done and it will be fine. And we forget that God put us here with people because that's how he has designed all of this to begin with. You were never intended to be the one that saved the world. You were never intended to be the one that got everything done just the right way. What God intended was for us as a church to do his mission within our world. And so as Nehemiah comes in, he goes and scouts all this stuff out, and then he comes back and says, now let us go do this. And then the people who were doing the work said, we're going to go do this, and they went and did but I want to remind you about San, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah. We met them in verse 10 to remind us, when Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite uh, servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. And don't we know people like this? They hear something uh, that's going on and it's not the way they would want it to happen and whether it's good or bad or whatever, and they're just, they're just kind of annoyed by it. Uh, Jay, uh, Jet mentioned in class the idea that sometimes people that kind of go down this, this road become the cynics and everything becomes kind of negative. And I can be guilty of this at times if I'm not cautious. So they're just upset that this is going on and they weren't asked about it and uh, good things are happening for the Jewish people. And then we meet them again in verse 19. And it says, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, so now they've got a friend to also be annoyed with them. They jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion right now or, or right in the claim in Jerusalem. So we're also going to have to have, if we are making the most of our opportunities, perseverance. It is not always going to be easy. There are going to be things that come along as a struggle, some of them minor, some of them major, and we have to keep going. There will be people, as we live in exile, that are trying to make the life of being a Christian as difficult as it can be, and you got to keep going. And what we will see in God's people in exile is that's exactly what they do. As they keep meeting all these different challenges, all these different struggles, they persevere. And for us this morning, as we're living here in 2023, we are called on to persevere. And then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the tower of the hundred, as far as the tower of Hananel. They took the plunge. I love how chapter three begins. All of the preparation for it, all of the planning, everything, that, all, all the, the adversaries they're going to meet, all of the difficulties that come with it, all of the planning that goes in. And what do they do in the next chapter to begin? We're building. It's time to now do it. And I feel like sometimes we get lost somewhere along there on the way, don't we? We know. We know God has given us opportunity. We don't always exactly know what it is. It's not always the way we would do it, but we know it's there. And sometimes we'll get as far as kind of figuring it out and understanding what God does and even maybe making a plan of this is how we should do it, this is how we should fix it. But do we take that step to actually go and to build? 
And this morning, I don't know where you're at on that path. Unintentional pee right there. I don't know where you're at on that path. Maybe you just look at it and think it's too much. Maybe you look somewhere along the way and you think, I don't know how to do this, and so I'm just going to stay away from it. Maybe you know what should be done, but you just don't think you have the energy, or maybe you're too old, or maybe you're too young. Maybe you look at it and you say that what's up against us is just too big. And God would say, you know, I've done all of those things before and I can do them again. I'm with you. And he says, just take the plunge. Be the one to begin to build. Today, if you have never followed him, you could take the literal plunge up here. You can be baptized into him, rise to walk in a new life, leave your old life behind you. Or if you have found yourself brought down by the, the things of this world, the adversaries that are around us, the difficulties, know that you can come back to him. You can, like God's people in exile, come back and know what it is to be his people again. If there's some way we can help you, please come while we stand and sing.